Welcome to the revision video for Criminal Law General Principles. Theories of Punishment We can classify these theories into three main types. The Absolute Theory, the Relative Theories and the Combination Theory. Underneath the heading Absolute Theory, we have the Retributive Theory. Underneath the heading Relative Theories, we have the Preventative Theory, the Deterrence Theory and the Reformative Theory. The Deterrence Theory can further be divided into Individual Deterrence and General Deterrence. Let's look at these theories in more detail. We have already seen that we only have one type of absolute theory. We call this the retributive theory. The retributive theory is not the same as vengeance. In other words, it is not revenge. The purpose of this theory is to restore legal balance. When a person commits a crime, they will disturb this legal balance. Retribution is the restoring of the legal balance and therefore we can say that the legal scales must be balanced. Under this theory, X is punished because it is his just desert. In other words, this is what he deserves. Punishment is a way to restore the legal balance. If X is not punished, he will be seen as a free rider and the balance will be disturbed. The punishment must be proportional to the crime. Let's look at our relative theories. The first one that we will deal with is the preventative theory. Here, the main aim is to prevent future crime. To use this theory, there must be a good possibility that the offender will commit a crime again. However, this theory can be criticised. The courts do not know for certain whether an offender will commit a crime again or not. However, the courts can look at prior convictions, as this may indicate whether an offender is likely to commit a crime again. If an offender has prior convictions, the court may sentence him to a longer term of imprisonment than a first-time offender. This is a preventative measure. Let's have a look at the deterrence theory. We can divide this theory into the individual deterrence theory and the general deterrence theory. With the individual deterrence theory, the aim is to punish the individual in order to teach him and deter him from committing another crime. The criticism here is that this theory is not very effective due to the high number of repeat offenders in South Africa. Under the general deterrence theory, the main aim is to instill a fear of punishment in the community as a whole. This will serve as a deterrent to the whole community from committing crimes. This theory is criticised because it relies on the probability that an offender will actually be caught and convicted. In other words, there must be a belief in the police's ability to catch the offenders. There must be a belief in an effective prosecution which will result in a conviction. And there must be a belief in an effective sentence. This is the belief that a person will serve their full sentence without early parole or escape from prison. Let's look at the reformative theory. Under this theory, the main aim is to rehabilitate the offender. This theory believes that an offender commits a crime because of a personality defect. For example, where an offender was beaten as a child. Therefore, the focus is on the person and the personality of the offender. The actual crime committed is not important. This theory can be criticised as follows. It is difficult for the courts to determine how much time is required for a specific offender to rehabilitate. The length of imprisonment might not be proportionate to the crime committed. Many people believe that only young people can be rehabilitated because it is difficult to change old habits. This theory lends itself to the belief that one can rehabilitate a person who displays tendencies 
towards the possibility of committing a crime. In other words, you do not even have to wait for a person to actually commit a crime before you begin to rehabilitate them. You only need to think that they might commit a crime. This undermines the culpability requirement for liability. Therefore, we can say that this is a theoretical ideal rather than a reality. Let's look at the combination theory. Our courts use this theory. The courts look at three factors when sentencing an accused. This was emphasized in the case of Zinn. Number one, the crime. This relates to the harm which was committed. This is an example of the retributive theory, which states that the punishment must be proportionate to the crime. Number two, the criminal. This relates to the personality and personal circumstances of the offender. This is an example of the reformative theory, which aims to help the offender to become a normal law-abiding citizen. Number three, society's interests. This relates to the desire to have a crime-free society. In other words, this is an example of the preventative and deterrence theories. In particular, the general deterrence theory. Let's look at the difference between a crime and a delict. A crime is governed by public law. Public law focuses on the interests of the community as a whole. Here, the state prosecutes the accused. The state has an onus of proof. They must prove that the accused is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the accused is found guilty, he will be punished. This can be done by means of a jail sentence or a fine. Here, the courts will follow the rules of criminal procedure. Let's compare this to a delict. Delicts are governed by private law. Private law focuses on the interests of the individual. Here, the two parties will be the plaintiff versus the defendant. The plaintiff has the onus of proof. He must prove that the defendant is guilty on a balance of probabilities. If the defendant is found guilty, he must pay damages in the form of money. Here, the courts will follow the rules of civil procedure. Criminal liability. In order to find somebody guilty of a crime, we must establish criminal liability. There are certain requirements which must be met in a specific order. Number one, there must be an act. Number two, the act must comply with the definitional elements of a crime. Number three, this must be an unlawful act. In other words, there must be no grounds of justification. And number four, there must be culpability. Culpability is defined as having criminal capacity plus intention or negligence. Be very careful not to confuse these words. Criminal liability has four requirements. The fourth requirement is culpability. Culpability is made up of criminal capacity and intention or negligence. Let's look at the principle of legality. In Latin, we call this the nullum crimen sine lege. The nullum crimen sine lege rule focuses on the crime. Let's look at the definition of the principle of legality. It states that an accused cannot be convicted of a crime unless the conduct or the action with which the accused is charged has been recognized by the law as a crime. In Latin, this requirement is called the jus acceptum. This must be recognized in clear terms. This requirement in Latin is the jus certum. It must be recognized in clear terms before the conduct took place. This requirement 
is called the Jus Pravium. And finally, the definition of the crime must not be interpreted in a broad fashion in order to cover the accused's conduct. This requirement is called the Jus Strictum. Number two, the Nulla Poena rule focuses on the sentence. If an accused is convicted, his sentence must also comply with these four requirements above. Let's look at this in more detail. Number one, the US accept him. The conduct must be accepted as a crime. Let's look at a little bit of background knowledge. Government can be divided into three branches. The legislature, the executive and the judiciary. The legislature makes laws. Therefore, we can also say that the legislature makes crimes because they write the statutes that recognize these crimes. The executive then enforces the law. For example, the police. And finally, the judiciary interprets and applies these laws. Therefore, we can see that the judiciary cannot make laws and therefore they cannot make crimes. This was confirmed in the case of Masia. This is a very important case. Section 35.3 of the Constitution states that every accused has the right to a fair trial. This includes the right not to be convicted of a crime which was not recognized as an offense at the time it was committed. Therefore, we can see that the U.S. acceptum rule can be found in our Constitution under Section 35.3. Number 2. U.S. Certum. The definition of the crime must be clear. In other words, they must be easily understood by the general public. Number 3. Jus Pravium. A crime must not be created with retrospective effect. Section 35.3 of the Constitution grants every accused the right to a fair trial. This includes the right not to be convicted of a crime which was not recognized as an offense at the time it was committed. In other words, just because a crime is recognized today does not mean it was recognized previously when the accused committed the action. Therefore, we can see that the U.S. Pravium Rule can also be found in our Constitution under Section 35.3. Number 4. U.S. Strictum. The definition of a crime must be interpreted strictly. In other words, the courts will follow a narrow sense of interpretation. This means that the definition of a crime must not be interpreted in a broad sense, simply to try and include the conduct of the accused under the definition of the crime. However, there is an exception to this rule. In the case of Masia, the Constitutional Court held that courts may use a wide interpretation of the crime in exceptional circumstances so long as this interpretation promotes the values found in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Remember, the principle of legality focuses both on the crime as well as on the sentence. We will now look at the Nulla Poena Rule. Section 35.3n of the Constitution states that every accused has the right to a fair trial. This includes the right to benefit from the least severe of the prescribed punishments, if the prescribed punishment has been changed between the time that the offence was committed and the time of sentencing. In other words, if the sentence for assault is five years at the time that X committed the crime, but it becomes ten years at the time that he is convicted, the sentence cannot be detrimental to the accused. So we will not give him the higher sentence, we will rather give him the lower sentence of five years. Let's look at the different types of crimes. We have statutory crimes and common law crimes. Statutory crimes are the crimes created by the legislature. 
these crimes must comply with the principle of legality. In other words, the legislature must state what conduct is a crime and what the punishment is for that crime. This is known as a criminal sanction. For example, you may not trespass here as it is a criminal offence and it is punishable with imprisonment for a maximum of two months or a maximum fine for 500 rand, or both. Let's look at how this compares with a common law crime. Common law crimes are created over time. Common law is the unwritten law, where a statutory law is written and recorded. Let's look at the difference between a legal norm, a criminal norm, and a criminal sanction. A legal norm is a legal rule. It does not create a crime. For example, you may not trespass here. A criminal norm is a provision in an act which defines certain conduct as a crime. For example, you may not trespass here as it is a criminal offence. A criminal sanction is a provision in an act which defines certain conduct as a crime and sets down the possible punishment which a court must impose when convicting an offender of the crime. For example, you may not trespass here as it is a criminal offence and it is punishable with imprisonment for a maximum of two months or a maximum fine of 500 rand or both. A criminal sanction complies with the principle of legality. Let's look at an investigation process in a criminal case. First we need to look at the act. Once we have proved that an accused acted, we need to make sure those actions comply with the definitional elements of the crime. We have two different types of crimes which we will get into just now. If we are dealing with a material crime, we will now need to look at causation. Thereafter, we will look at unlawfulness and culpability. These elements all need to be followed in a specific order. We will now look at the Act in more detail. The Act An Act is a voluntary human act or omission. Let's look at the first part of this definition. Voluntary Conduct is deemed to be voluntary if X is capable of subjecting his bodily movements to his will or intellect. There are three factors which exclude voluntariness. Number one, absolute force or vis absoluta. Number two, natural force or vis maior. This is an act of God. And number three, automatism. Let's look at absolute force. Absolute force is called vis absoluta in Latin. An example of absolute force is the following. Mary is making a salad and is using a knife to chop carrots. Jay, who is much bigger and much stronger than Mary, overpowers her and forces her hand with the knife still in it into Sam's back, stabbing and killing him. Mary was unable to defend herself because she was physically weaker. In this scenario, Mary did not act. It was Jay who performed the act, using her as an instrument. The leading case for absolute force is Hercules. Do not confuse absolute force with relative force. Let's have a look at the difference. With absolute force, our keyword is overpowered. Here, the action was not voluntary, and therefore the person can use the defense that they did not act. Here, our leading case is Hercules. With relative force, the person is compelled. In other words, here, A says to B that A will shoot B if B does not kill X. This means that B is being forced or compelled to kill X. If he does not kill X, he will be killed himself by A. Here, 
we can see that B does pull the trigger and that he is in control of his bodily movements when doing so. Therefore, this was a voluntary act. His defense will be that his action was not unlawful. Here he can use a ground of justification, such as necessity. We will be looking at this later. The leading case for relative force is Goliath. Let's look at the second factor which excludes the voluntariness of the act. Natural force, or vis maior in Latin. Vis maior is an act of God. For example, a fire. If a fire breaks out inside Y's hotel and X smashes a window to escape from harm, he does not commit an act for which he can be punished. Let's look at the third factor excluding the voluntariness of the act. Sane automatism. Sane automatism occurs when a person acts in a mechanical fashion. In other words, the person is unable to control their bodily movements. For example, sleepwalking, nightmares, sneezing, epileptic fits, etc. Let's look at some examples of automatism from case law. In the case of Duplessis, X, an elderly man, was charged with negligent driving after injuring a pedestrian. According to medical evidence, he suffered a blackout due to having low blood pressure. He was found not guilty. In Lamini, X and some other people were sleeping on the floor in a room. X had a nightmare and stabbed Y while still under the influence of his dream. He was found not guilty. In the case of Mkize, X stabbed and killed Y while having an epileptic fit. He was found not guilty. It is very important to understand the difference between sane automatism and insane automatism. Sane automatism is an action which is not voluntary and therefore the person can use the defense that they did not act. Our leading cases are Duplessis, Dlamini and Mkize. Here the onus is on the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that X's act was voluntary. With insane automatism which we will cover later in more detail, we are dealing with a mental illness. Here the person's act is voluntary and therefore we can say that they did act. The defense that they will use here will be mental illness and this is governed by section 578 subsection 1 of the Criminal Procedure Act. This was confirmed in the case of Trickett. The leading case for mental illness or insane automatism is the case of Cavan. Here, the onus is on the accused to prove on a balance of probabilities that he is mentally ill. Let's look at antecedent liability. If X knows that he suffers from an ailment, such as epilepsy or blackouts, and he chooses to still operate a motor vehicle or heavy machinery or something of the likeness, while hoping that his condition will not occur, he cannot rely on sane automatism. Here he will be culpable in the form of negligence. The leading case for antecedent liability is Victor. X had an accident while driving and was convicted of negligent driving. Although X had had an epileptic fit at the time of the accident, he could not rely on the defense of sane automatism. This was because he had been suffering from epileptic fits for the last 13 years, and therefore he did not have reason to believe that he would not have a fit on that day. Therefore, X was guilty of negligent driving. A person will still be allowed to drive if they suffer from certain ailments 
so long as they take the necessary medication to prevent the condition from occurring. Where a person drives and chooses not to take their pills or forgets to take their pills, they will be liable under antecedent liability because of their negligence. Therefore, with antecedent liability, the action was the failure to take their pills. We are busy dealing with the act and the voluntariness thereof. We now need to look at the defense of impossibility. It will be impossible in certain circumstances for X to subject his bodily movements to his will or intellect. With the defense of impossibility, we need to look at the voluntariness of an omission. An omission is voluntary if it is possible for X to perform the positive act. For example, if X is hospitalized due to a serious illness, it will not be possible for him to report for military duty. X can use the defense of impossibility. This was held in the case of Morstadt. In order to use the defense of impossibility, there are three requirements which must be met. 1. There must have been a positive duty on X to act. This was held in the case of Canestra. Number 2. It must have been objectively impossible for X to have acted in accordance with the law. This was held in the case of Liu. And finally, number 3. X must not be responsible for the impossibility. In other words, he must not be personally responsible. An act is a voluntary human act or omission. In other words, only a human being can be punished for committing a crime. There is an exception to this rule. A human who uses an instrument to commit a crime will be liable. For example, where X sets his dog on Y and the dog bites Y, X will still be liable for assault. He has used his dog as an instrument to commit the crime of assault. An act is a voluntary human act or omission. Let's look at the difference between an act and an omission. An act is a positive action. We can call this a commission. An omission is a negative action. In other words, this is a failure to act. There is a duty to act positively on people in certain instances, such as a legal duty or a moral duty. However, an omission will only be punishable by law when there is a legal duty to act positively. So when is there a legal duty on a person to act positively? According to the case of Evils, there is a legal duty on a person when the legal convictions of society require X to act positively. There are eight recognized legal duties to act positively. Number one, statute. For example, the duty to pay tax and to file an annual income tax return. Number two, common law. For example, there is a duty on all citizens in South Africa to report any activity regarding an act of high treason. Intentional omission to do so is also deemed to be an act of high treason. Number three, agreement. In the case of Pitwood, X agreed with a railway company to close a gate every time a train went over a crossing. One day, X omitted to do so and an accident was caused. X was held liable. Take note that an agreement is simply another word for a contract. Number four, accepting responsibility for a dangerous thing. In the case of Fernandez, X failed to repair a baboon's cage. The baboon escaped and killed a child. X was liable for the actions of the baboon. Number five, protective relationship. In the case of B, X failed to stop her boyfriend from assaulting her child. 
X had a legal duty to care for and protect her child. She failed to do so and was convicted of assault. A previous positive act. This is called an omission per commissionum in Latin. For example, where X lights a fire in the felt and then fails to put it out. Number 7. Office held. In the case of Ervils, a policeman saw X assaulting Y. The policeman failed to stop the assault. The court held that the policeman had a positive duty to assist Y. Number 8. An order of court. For example, the court can order X to pay Y maintenance. X then fails to pay that maintenance. We are now finished with the act. We can now move on to the definitional elements of the crime. A crime can be defined in two ways. We have formally defined crimes and materially defined crimes. Materially defined crimes can also be called result or consequence crimes. In a formally defined crime, specific conduct is prohibited. The result which occurs due to that act is irrelevant. It is the actual conduct that is prohibited. For example, the possession of drugs. Here, we do not care what happens if somebody takes the drugs. We only care about the actual conduct, the actual possession of the drugs. In a materially defined crime, the result of certain actions is prohibited. For example, murder. Here, the result is caused by the actions. It is not the actions that are important, but rather the result. For example, in murder, it does not matter how the person was killed. It only matters that the result is that the person is dead. These crimes require causation. Let's look at causation in more detail. Here we can see that we have dealt with an act. We have dealt with the definitional elements. When we are dealing with material crimes, we will now deal with causation. If we are dealing with formally defined crimes, we can skip straight to unlawfulness. Let's now deal with causation. Causation only applies to materially defined crimes. Here, there must be a causal link between X's act and the result. For example, X shoots a gun. The result is that Y is killed by X. In other words, X causes Y's death when he shoots him. A causal link in Latin is a nexus. In some cases, it can be difficult to determine what caused Y's death. For example, Y is shot and seriously wounded in a bank robbery by shooter X. Z, who is Y's friend, drives Y to the hospital. But in the rush, Z has an accident and Y dies on impact. In this scenario, we have to ask ourselves what was the cause of Y's death? The shooting or the accident? Our courts have certain rules to follow in situations where the cause of a person's death is not always 100% clear. For X to be criminally liable in materially defined crimes, X must be both the factual and the legal cause of Y's death. Let's look at factual causation. In Latin, factual causation is called the conditio sine qua non. If X's act is the conditio sine qua non of Y's death, X will have factually caused Y's death. X will be said to have caused Y's death if Y would not have died but for X's act. Therefore, we can call the conditio sine qua non test the but for test. But for X shooting Y, Y would not have been in a car crash and died. Therefore, X is the factual cause of Y's death. Let's now look at legal causation. For legal causation to be established, 
we must look at policy considerations and three theories. Policy considerations are factors which would confirm that it would be reasonable and fair to regard X's act as the cause of Y's death. The three theories of legal causation are as follows. Number one, the individualization theory. This can also be called the proximate theory. Number two, the adequate causation theory. And number three, the novice actus intervenience. Let's look at the first theory, the individualization theory. This theory states that one must look at all the possible factual causes of the prohibited situation. The courts must then choose the one that is the most workable and refer to that one as the legal cause of the prohibited situation. This theory was rejected by the courts in the case of Daniels. The adequate causation theory. An act will be the legal cause of a situation if, according to human experience, in the normal course of events, the act has the tendency to bring about that kind of situation. In our example above, according to human experience and in the normal course of events, if a person gets into a car, will the person die? The answer here is no. Therefore, X will not be the legal cause of Y's death. Eunice prefers this theory. However, this theory has been criticized due to its vagueness and its ineffectiveness. The novice actus intervenience. This is when a new intervening event occurs between X's initial act and the ultimate death of Y. The new intervening action breaks the chain of causation, which stops X from being the legal cause of Y's death. A novice actus is defined as an unexpected, abnormal occurrence, which according to human experience, deviates from the normal course of events. Here we can see that this is similar to the adequate causation theory. In our example above, the car crash is a new, unexpected and abnormal event. In other words, it is a novice actus intervenience. Therefore, X is not the legal cause of Y's death. Let's look at causation case law. Khrushchev. X assisted his wife in committing suicide by giving his crippled wife a loaded rifle. His wife then killed herself. The appeal court then held that where a person commits an act which is the very purpose X had in mind, Y's act cannot be regarded as a novice actus. In other words, X was found guilty of murder. In Daniels, X shot Y and seriously wounded him. Y needed urgent medical attention in order to survive. However, Y was subsequently shot by Z. X and Z did not know each other and they shot Y independently of one another. Here, the court of quo held that X's act was factually and legally the cause of Y's death. This court held that Z's action was not a novice actus intervenience. The appeal court held that Z's action was a novice actus intervenience. Therefore, X was not the legal cause of Y's death. X could only be convicted of attempted murder, whereas Z could be convicted of murder. We will now look at the case of Mocheti and Tembani. Please note that these two are very important cases and you must know them well. Mocheti. X shot Y during a bank robbery. Y became a paraplegic and was confined to a wheelchair as a result of being shot. Y's doctor told Y to regularly change his position in the wheelchair to prevent sores from developing. Y did not follow his doctor's advice and as a result he developed sores. 
these sores then became infected with septicemia and resulted in his death. He died within six months of being shot. The court held that but for X shooting Y, Y would not have been in a wheelchair and developed septicemia. Therefore, X is the factual cause of Y's death. Septicemia was a new, unexpected and abnormal event. In other words, it was a novice actus intervenience. And therefore, X is not the legal cause of Y's death. The court held that Y himself was responsible for his own death because he failed to follow the advice of his doctor. And therefore, X could only be found guilty of attempted murder. In Timbani, X shot Y and seriously wounded her. She was admitted to hospital. The treatment received during hospitalization was negligent and she died within two weeks due to septicemia, which resulted from the gunshot wound. The court held that but for X shooting Y, Y would not have been in hospital and would not have died. Therefore, X is the factual cause of Y's death. The court then had to determine whether negligent treatment in a hospital amounted to a novice actus intervenience. The court held that medical resources in South Africa are in short supply. A person cannot expect to have access to reliable and efficient medical treatment. Therefore, negligent medical treatment is not a new intervening act. The court also held that so long as the wound remained fatal, the culpability of the perpetrator would not diminish. Therefore, X was found to be the legal cause of Y's death, and therefore, X was guilty of murder. Please make sure you understand the difference between Mocheti and Tembani extremely well. For more information, refer to pages 17 and 18 of the SWAT Smart Study Notes. We have come to the end of part 1 of the Criminal Law Revision.